Hello, and welcome to episode one of the Motivational Millennial Podcast. Woohoo! We are so excited to be here with you today and share with you an interview we did with Janine Cohen. She is a woman I met through the Coaches Training Institute when we were doing the Coactive Coach Training Program. She is a adventure travel specialist, and it was just really fun to do the interview with her because there was just a flowing fountain of of wisdom and and uh, nuggets of wisdom. And even after we stopped recording, we would just be in conversation with Janine and say, oh my gosh, that's so great. Let, let's just turn on the recording again. And so um, some of that might be included as well, but it was just a lot of fun and we're really looking forward to sharing her with you. Um, she has a great story. At the end, after we've interviewed her, Stay tuned because Blake and I will do an after show where we will talk about our biggest takeaways from the interview. Let's go. Our motivational millennial guest today is Janine Cohen. She is a Latin America luxury and adventure travel expert, as seen in Travel and Leisure, Yahoo Travel, Fortune, ABC, CBS, Travel Weekly, and much more. Janine is committed to curating once-in-a-lifetime journeys and travels to the Southern Hemisphere on exploratory trips several times a year to uncover insider and unique experiences. Currently, she is the managing director at GeoX, a high-end adventure travel company that crafts wanderlust-fueled journeys to the ends of the earth. Thank you so much for being here, Janine. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, adventure travel is so exciting. We really want to hear more about your work and why you're so passionate about it. Absolutely. As you mentioned, I'm the managing director of Geographic Expeditions, and that's one of the oldest and most established adventure travel companies in the United States. Um, And I have the great privilege to get to go into the field multiple times per year to do field research and check out some of our adventures around around the globe. And so that means when I'm in the field that I'm getting to see some of the most spectacular places on the planet um, doing rafting and mountain biking and hiking trips there. That is amazing. That's a great gig. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So tell us, what do you love about it? Well, everything, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say the opportunity to get to meet some really incredible people in different places and also be in some pretty spectacular natural settings, really beautiful national parks in the mountains. Really, every day is, is different and really, really exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. So we'd love to hear about a defining moment in your life that helped you realize uh, your sense of purpose, maybe helped you define your passion. Is there a moment that you can share that sort of sticks out to you? Yes. So I grew up in South Florida, flat as a pancake and <laughs> not really having any exposure to the outdoors at all. And when I moved here to California, I went to UCLA as an undergraduate And when I was there, I became involved with the outdoor leadership program there at UCLA and was suddenly exposed to all of these incredible backcountry places all over California and the Southwest Mm -hmm. and really got exposed to deep wilderness kinds of adventures that that changed my life and changed the course of my life, I would say, up until now. And so I did that while I was in university. It was a job. Also, I ended up becoming a backcountry guide while I was in college there. And when I left college, I moved to New York City and I ended up working in travel for a travel magazine. And that seemed like a good idea at the time, but New York City was not for me. It was really an urban environment. I I really wasn't traveling that much. And the magazine that I was working for, I didn't feel had values that were in line with mine. It was really all about consumption and presidential suites and and private jet travel. And and it just there wasn't any alignment there. And I remember, you know, talking about a defining moment that I was in my office on the 50th floor of a building overlooking the snow in New York City and my phone rang 
And it was my best friend who had a job on a cruise ship and she was traveling all over the world and loving it and having a great time. And here I was sitting in February in the winter in New York and just so, so very miserable. (laughs) (laughs) And in that moment, I realized, what am I doing here? And within two weeks, I was in Central America working for an organization called Outward Bound. I moved, packed up very quickly, moved down there, um, and then started working with that organization to help get people into the wilderness uh, in places in Nicaragua, Central, in Costa Rica, and Panama. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of the start of my career in the industry, so to speak. That's, yeah. I think it's really powerful how recognizing your own values, it sounds like, was such a transformative moment and saying, is what I'm doing right now in alignment with those? And then making that leap, literally, uh, with Outward Bound and going into Central America. Mm-hmm. Um, were you, as as you were traveling in that initial transition, were you thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know how this is going to turn out? Or did you have a sense of, I'm on a mission, you know, I guess, was there a lot of uncertainty for you at that time? Well, I think there was a real clarity in what I didn't want to do. (laughs) And I think that that is really important for anyone who's growing professionally or just in their life, that to get to that place of clarity, you have to try some things that might not work. And so there was a lot of uncertainty going into that experience, um, which ended up being great in a lot of ways, um, really transformative. And then when I finished that experience and I took a bus from Central America, I decided to come back by bus to California. That only seemed appropriate at the time. (laughs) So when I came by bus through Central America, I had finished my contract at Outward Bound. And so I was coming to California. I knew I would have to find a job. And... The uncertainty was difficult, I would say. I think it always is. And in fact, it was so distracting for me at certain moments that I would say I really wasn't in the moment of that of that place. But I think, you know, looking back on it now, the lesson just being that things do work out. And they did for me. I wish I would have taken that time to really be present where I was instead of worrying about the future. Mm -hmm. In contrast, I mean, you've had this amazing journey then from that, from that place in in New York City. So how do you feel? I mean, how's it feel different? You know, what's the comparison? Like, how are you feeling on the inside or about your life? I feel totally in in, total alignment with my values now and what I believe in and I just feel so lucky every day that I wake up. I think that for the life that I've chosen, this is the very best version of it. And I get to work within a company where I'm very well respected and in an industry where I connect so deeply to people inside and outside of my organization. And I think uh, it's not an accident that I landed there. But I think all the people who you'll find specifically in the adventure travel industry have a common story. And that story is that they were willing to take some risks and also forge their own path because there's not really a handbook for that. There's not a quote unquote career path on how to make it an adventure travel. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on this path, since you, you, you took that leap, have you, uh, you know, if I know you, you said that you experienced some some challenge um, during that transition. Um, do you feel like that was one of your biggest challenges? I mean, we'd love to hear about what you felt like was your biggest challenge on this journey mm-hmm. and how you ended up overcoming that challenge. Yeah, I mean, that time that I mentioned was a big challenge, but I also, um, you know, there have been other challenging times, mm-hmm. too. It hasn't been easy the whole the whole way. So. Yeah. Um, you know, another challenging moment for me was 2009 when we had the big recession. Yeah. I, like many other people in the travel industry, lost my job. And that was really difficult because a big part of my identity was really wrapped up in my profession and in my job. And so, you know, again, there was a lot of uncertainty in that moment. Um, but 
and nobody was hiring in my industry in like in many industries and that time period i decided to retrain and i connected with the Renaissance Center for Entrepreneurship in San Francisco, which is an, inc an incredible nonprofit that helps small business owners go from just the very foundational ideas of a business to inception and then actually having the business thrive. And I went into that program and uh, really I, I created a business plan and learned all of the essentials of business from financials to marketing and sales. And I think, you know, thinking about those really challenging times, those are the opportunities when you can really, for me, when I've been able to have the most growth. Mm -hmm. And that was a tremendous amount of growth. And in fact, I use the skills that I learned in that program every single day at my job. And it was some of the most learning that I've ever done. And in fact, I'm so connected with that organization now that I, I work as a volunteer helping small business owners with it. And that's how I got connected with my current job now, actually, is that yeah. I did launch that business and I was a consultant for some time and um, just kind of emerged as, a, as an industry leader of sorts, just in that I started to become much more well-networked. And then my job found me essentially it wasn't my intention to have another full-time job at that point but you know those that's just how it worked out yeah I just I find that so beautiful and inspiring that you are you are in this this moment where you know could have easily potentially given up on what you were excited about and passionate about and what, what you'd been already pursuing um, but instead decided to continue and to grow and use it as an opportunity and then that's led you to this, you know, amazing place that you're at now that you're saying, oh, my gosh, like, this is the, this is the peak of, of what this could look like. That's amazing. Yeah. So based on uh, some of the challenges that you've had, but also the commitment to really pursuing what you're passionate about, is there some advice that you would be able to give other millennials who are also on this journey, um, you know, towards their success and life fulfillment, um, either maybe they're facing some challenges or they're starting out, you know, what, what kind of advice could you give to millennials who are also trying to uh, walk this path? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so much advice that I could give, but I just, you know, humbly have so much to take in from my mentors. So I guess the first thing would be to have really great mentors mm -hmm. is, is yeah. essential people who will support you, but also tell you like it is. And I've been really fortunate to have that over the years. You know, related to that, I think asking for help and also reaching out to people in industries that you're interested in is, is, is great. But if I had to say something specific about that, I would say make it convenient for that person and make it easy. So when mm -hmm. I say that, mm -hmm. I mean... If you want to have an informational interview, be proactive about it. Do it at that person's convenience. If you want an intro, make it easy for that person to introduce you. So give them the text that they need about you and what you want. Mm -hmm. And then related to what you want, that's really important too. Getting clear about what what is it that you want. And getting clear about what you want is, again, it's really tied in with your values it's not just about making a list of goals. It's really about doing a lot of work internally to figure out what your values are. And so there's a workbook that I would recommend related to that called Your Best Year Yet. And I like Your Best Year Yet because I think for me and probably many other millennials, sometimes it can be really overwhelming to think about things in multiple years. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see past this year, and so your best year yet really allows you to focus on this year. What else? Um, kindness. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's successful in business will tell you that that's first and foremost, kindness and respect. Mm. To really surround yourself with the best people who are better and smarter than you, and then just treat them, treat them with all of the respect and kindness that you would want to be treated with yourself. 
And that, I think, took me a while to learn. When I first started in my career, I really was trying to will things to the way that I thought or wanted them to be. Mm-hmm. But it's really the relationships that matter the most. Mm-hmm. And those relationships, when you're thinking about those relationships, your, your network is really your net worth. So there's not any job that I ever got from a job board. Mm -hmm. It was always connecting with someone and then connecting with somebody else. And, you know, when you're connecting with those people, for me, it's not about what I can get from them. It's really about listening and learning. And that isn't that common, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, in this day and age. And I think people see it and appreciate it. I love what you're saying about surrounding yourself with people who you really respect and and admire. And I love this because sometimes we have a tendency, especially if we're just starting out, like you're mentioning, to compare ourselves in a negative way to people who are, you know, established and doing really well. And we're thinking, why are we, why am I not there? Am I not? And, and if we're, if we make the mistake of focusing on a comparison that could lead to a, a feeling of, you know, competition or something, then then there's not that openness to actually this is a really amazing opportunity for me to connect with someone who is awesome and who is inspiring and who is you know can could really show me the the way to on this path to my goals, you know. And so I love that uh, that approach of being just very deliberate of when we see that it's it's a really positive opportunity to to get to learn more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting to hear you say that I've never I've never felt that a competition. I don't know if it's something about my industry that makes it that way. It's very collaborative. Oh, great. Yeah. But I think also going to a lot of these networking events in your industry kind of fosters that collaboration. Maybe Mm. with mine specifically, it's kind of designed to be that way. Mm. That's wonderful. Yeah. I'm interested. You mentioned um, you used to really want to try to will these things to happen. Um, Was there a moment that shifted that or was it a gradual process or maybe a mentor i'm just interested in how you made that shift because that's a lot of self-awareness and you know it's a pretty powerful transformation Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think i think it was gradual i think i did get some feedback related to that and the feedback is so valuable and i think you know, that's kind of a piece of advice too, is to welcome that feedback. Because again, those are some of the moments that you grow the most and really kind Mm -hmm. of solicit that feedback, not be afraid of it. I mean, I'm naturally a challenger. So I'm always pushing people to do their best. But sometimes pushing isn't really the right thing to do. And really supporting people is kind of the transcendent form of being a leader Mm -hmm. when you do surround yourself with great people and you can support them to do the best work that they're doing not the not necessarily the way that you'd be doing it but the way that they know how to do it best and really trusting deeply in their capabilities is key but i think also you know ivy with regards to your comment of the people that you keep around you i mean i think also for millennials it's really important to think about age diversity so mm-hmm. keeping an array of friends that are different in different age groups from you mm-hmm. is really really important to success because there's just so much to learn from people who are significantly you know older or younger and different generations all of those people have a lot to to offer yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. What, was there any other advice, like burning advice that you had? I just wanted to provide you that space if there was anything else that you were thinking of. Yes. So I think it's important to never tie your personal brand entirely to one company. Hmm. To build your personal brand as a personal brand within your industry and through social media, but also in person events. So like public speaking, for example, that's a huge opportunity to elevate your personal brand. And it any great company that values and respects you will encourage you to do that because it only elevates their brand as well to have you associated with them. 
Will you explain a little bit more about what you mean by personal brand? So for me, personal brand really, the professional and the personal is really intertwined. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of millennials would agree with that. Mm -hmm. So the person that you are on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, I mean, for me, it's easy because I'm going to all of these places and I have this great content I can share. Mm -hmm. Um, But really, again, I mean, kind of going back to your values, if, if you're... If your life is integrated, meaning that you're not a different person when you go to work than in your day-to-day personal life, then why not showcase that as one? And then it just reinforces your personal brand. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about that integration? Because I think that's one of the things that we're really focused on Motivational Millennial is helping people integrate the personal and the professional in a way that's really authentic and genuine and in alignment with their values. Um, But it can be really challenging as well. So how do you perceive that integration or do you have any things or suggestions that you've seen um, work well or that's worked well for you about how to integrate those pieces? Yeah, well, I mean, I think first and foremost, if you love the work that you do, then it's really easy to integrate because (laughs) it doesn't feel like work anymore. Mm -hmm. I think it's really challenging to integrate work and life when that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And when you, I mean, this has not been the case for me in any recent years, but, you know, there, I'm sure that, I mean, I know that there are people in this world who get up every day, they put on a certain face, certain clothing, and they walk out the door and they are who they are at their work. And then they come home and they're, a very different kind of a person. And for me, I mean, that's so not the case. In fact, sometimes I have a hard time, um, you know, pulling, pulling the work, you know, teasing that out and pulling it apart, the work and the, and the personal, because, you know, I go to all of these great places and meet people in my industry and we're all working and playing together in all of these incredible places around the world. But you know, that's my tribe. So that really fuels and energizes me. And so, yeah, I mean, again, I think it's just, it just comes easily. There's also a book on this topic that I would recommend written by Marcy Albohair called Slash. Hmm. And that's kind of a different theory about work-life integration. That's really about building, it's about people who have two different kinds of jobs at the same time that are very different and how to sort of build a bridge between them. Mm -hmm. So the book is called Slash. Awesome. We'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's fantastic. As far as other lessons go, one of the biggest ones for me is living a simple life. So the math equation is, is very easy on what you need to live. It's just more in than more out. And the simplicity of having a life that's, again, in line with your values and not crowded with all this stuff, but really investing in yourself and learning and and experiences means that you're that much more freed up to do the kind of work that you really want to do. When you have the trappings, the mortgage, the stuff, the clothes, all of these things trap you they can trap you they have that potential that now you need to find a job so you can make that much money to pay for all of these other things which is limiting so my industry the travel industry is not the highest paying industry but there's a lot of lifestyle benefits and a lot of this ability to have this work-life balance and integration that is positive and that's the most important thing for me And it sounds like you do a really um, conscious job of enforcing that for yourself, because I'm sure you could, if you wanted to work insane hours beyond what you already do um, and and not have that balance. But it sounds like part of that simplicity in that math equation is saying here are my boundaries and here are my limits. I mean, do you feel like you, you sort of consciously set those or do those naturally evolve from this philosophy of like the simplicity? Well, yeah. I mean, I think you're right that I do create those boundaries and the way that I create those boundaries is by setting them up 
with little tricks. So for example, how do I leave work every day at 5.30? I schedule something for seven o'clock. So that, and I pay for it in advance. So if I miss it, I lose that money. And usually it's it's working, it's a class, it's a workout and um, that supports everything that I'm doing in my work and my life anyway. And I feel like I, it's justifiable that I go because I'm investing again in myself as a person and my employer, luckily I'm with the right employer who values the fact that I'm coming to work with energy and intention and focus. And I know that the way that I can cultivate those things is by working out. Mm -hmm. So it's all just a very intentional, like you said, it's an intentional circle. And that's what I think certainly employers who view millennials as um, a positive resource and some of the values that a lot of millennials share, um, they recognize what you just said, which is a lot of these quote unquote external to work activities um, when scheduled appropriately, obviously, are really beneficial to bringing your full self, your focused self, your energized self to work. Um, and it's not, oh, you want to leave at 530 every day because, you know, you don't want to work. It's quite the opposite. You want to bring your best self to work every day. And leaving at 530 to do a workout, for example, really enables you to do that. Yeah, I think that's one thing that millennials really get, that they're just valuing that sense of balance. Mm -hmm. And Ivy, like like you said in your in your questions as well, that certain other generations perceive that as being entitled but you know again just kind of coming back to taking care of yourself and then you're able to take care of the people around you and the work that needs to be done and really focus on what's the most important work I, I think part of the values of this generation generally is that it's about results and not about time so the model of work in generations before has been trading time for money and that has shifted in this generation to be money for and money and rewards for results for positive results <laughs> it's like the foundational like component of the podcast that's awesome yeah it really is it really is yeah just before we, we move on, we just want to talk a little bit about what motivates you. And so what I wonder about is if you have a morning routine or something that you do when you wake up that gets you prepared and you know is going to set you up for having an awesome day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, so just your, the first part of your question, your question about what motivates me, I think it's a little bit different of a question of the other one of what, you know, how to get started on the day. But mm, yeah. What, so what motivates me is my belief in the power of travel, that it can have a huge positive impact on the world and that it exposes people who are sometimes of great means and influence to different environments and people all over the world. And then it makes them feel inspired to want to protect those places. So that is the meaning behind the work that I do and that's my motivation. And then in terms of your other question of what is the great start to a day for me, I really liked, so two things. So the first part is riding my bike to work. I always like to ride my bike to work because my bicycle is my internet anecdote. Yes. <laughs> what a great, great way to say that. I can't be sur I can't be checking my emails. I can't be surfing the web. There's just so much noise. It's so easy mm -hmm. to wake up and just dive into it. And riding my bike to work, just I just can't. Yeah. And then San Francisco, of course, is such a beautiful place to live. And you know, you get that morning fog and the cold wind in the morning, just wakes me up and really sets the tone for the day. And then when I get to the office, I like to get there usually a half an hour early so that I can set up for the day. And so I get to the office, I greet my team, I acknowledge them, and then they know that I'm there early so that I can 
that's not the time when they're asking me questions. That's the time when I'm getting organized. And so that's a theory, actually, that comes from chefs, world-class chefs from France Mm -hmm. originally and now all over the world, um, that they'll set up all of their their works, their ingredients and their workstation so that they can be prepared for the, for the day. Mm. And so when I get there, I like to take that time to organize, but also to think about what's important in the day instead of just letting the day pull me in a lot of different directions or jumping right into my, to my email. That intentionality makes such a difference for (laughs) sure. Setting your plan and your agenda for the day versus being in reaction mode. Um, Mm -hmm. And I really love what you said about writing to work being your kind of technology deterrent as well. And I'm just curious if you see um, other structures in your life or, or if you've put into place other structures in your life to kind of give you those spaces, either maybe away from technology or just spaces for you to think and reflect Mm -hmm. yeah so um, meditation and yoga is huge for me moving meditation so walking meditation is really important I'm I'm very lucky in that I work in the Presidio which is part of the Golden Gate National Parks And so that's a really beautiful area where there's nature all around, and that is really energizing. But I don't have time to not be good to myself. Hmm. Because if I can be good to myself, that's the only way that I can take care of the people around me. So it's not really a choice, because the days that I don't do that, and there are definitely those days. So I'm not here to say that I'm (laughs) perfect every day and I wake up and I meditate and every day is just amazing because, you know, the truth about adventure travel is it's exciting and it's different every day, but there's also risk involved with it. So there are some days that I wake up and there's been an earthquake in some place and I'm, Mm. you know, dealing with the fallout of that or someone slipped and fell and broke a bone and we're dealing with evacuating them out of a very remote area and you know those things happen so it's not like I always have control of my of my day but if I'm setting it up for success and doing the things that I know that I need to do to support my own energy then I can be that much more effective when those things come up versus if I'm letting my day be like a roller coaster and just take me where it will that is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say, I mean, just kind of back to the advice, is max out your vacation time. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you do that? (laughs) (laughs) And so many Americans don't do it. Mm -hmm. We're addicted to work, and I don't know why. I don't know why that is. We feel like we can't get away. We feel guilty. But... I mean, that if you're going to have a a long career, and life is long, Mm -hmm. why wouldn't you take that time? When I think about the moments that are the most memorable for me in work and in life, not the days that I'm sitting at my desk, the days that I'm in meetings, it's the days that I'm outside, out and about, doing things that I love. And luckily, that's a part of my job. But the worst day in the field is better than the best day in the office. I love that. Speaking of great quotes, could you share a motivational quote or a phrase or a book that's changed your life? I know you already mentioned um, your best year yet and slash um, anything else that comes to mind there. So as far as books go, I mean, there are so many, but my favorite is The Go-Giver. And, uh, you know, that's all about just giving back and giving more then you're receiving that. I think that's the success to any great leader. Uh, and then as far as quotes go, I personally really like a Tina Fey quote. And the Tina Fey quote goes, uh, say yes and figure it out later. Mm. And that's been my motto in life, you know, for better or for worse. I've been praised and criticized for it, but it remains is there something that you've said yes to that you were 
afraid to or very nervous about that's really changed your life? Um, I mean, I, there have been things that I've been uncomfortable about, certainly. I mean, but again, I think that's where the change is really kind of set in for me. Surfing, you know, just to have a really um, physical kind of metaphor, not metaphor, metaphor, you know, surfing is, I think it can be a metaphor, but it's also a real thing, right? Like I feel very <laughs> uncomfortable sometimes when I'm getting knocked around in the waves and I'm getting pulled under and I just, I'm there just a little bit longer than I'm okay with. And yet when I'm out there, I just feel so good. And I said that I wanted to do that last year, that I wanted to learn how to surf, and I knew that I felt afraid to do it, but I did it. And uh, now I have two surfboards, and I go out every moment that I can, and I love it. But how would you know that that could be a great passion if you don't try? I've done a lot of things physically that have been scary to me, I mean, one really silly thing, this will sound silly to other people, I grew up in Florida, so I never was really exposed to snow. But now I work in adventure travel in the mountains, and so I'm in snow all the time. But it still never feels totally natural to me, not having grown up in that kind of an environment. And so mm -hmm. I remember a couple of years ago in Canada, I did a Via Ferrata, which is... Um, kind of like a high ropes course, but it's in the alpine elevation. And it's really a, kind of an extreme sort of outdoorsman thing. And it was pretty scary in the moment, but I did it. But, you know, it's such a broad range of things that people are afraid of. And I've that was a lot of the work that I did at Outward Bound was... A lot of the people I was working with felt very uncomfortable about being in the outdoors in general. And then part of that program was we would do an overnight, a solo overnight, where they would be alone. And, you know, that's in the tropics. So you could have snakes or tarantulas mm -hmm. or heavy rains or whatever. But people always came out of that experience feeling like it was so transformative for them. So... You know, I'm kind of thinking about what is the next transformation for me. And I know that that process is going to be uncomfortable in some ways. But for me personally, it's essential to always be growing. It's not, not an option to, to do anything otherwise. Yeah, and saying yes provides you with more growth opportunities, you know, because and it can, like you said, open up a whole new world of something that you love, like the sur surfing that you have now discovered that you have, you hadn't have said yes, you wouldn't have found out. That's really great. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of on the older side of the millennials. I'm born in 1980. So that means I'm, I'm 35 years old. So 35 is a great age because it's a, this really great balance between knowing yourself, having the opportunity to have come into my own values and living an authentic life. That's huge mm -hmm. for me, living an authentic life, but also trying new things at the yeah. same time. So yeah. that's great. And that's something to look forward to for millennials who are younger than I am. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Well, wow. I mean, I feel I'm so happy that you are willing to be here with us and, and share all of your amazing wisdom and insights because I feel really energized myself and, and excited. Um, I would love for you to just tell the audience how they can learn more about you. Yeah, so you could look at my website. It's just JanineCohen.com. And then I'd also encourage anyone who's interested in adventure travel to take a look at Geographic Expedition's website, which is GOX.com. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. My handle is Janine Cohen. Simply, that's it, in all of those places. Great. We'll do that. Do that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Janine. Thanks to you. Thank you. You know, I, I loved speaking with Janine so much. Um, it's it's almost challenging to pick one of the, the many nuggets of wisdom that she has <laughs> laid before us. 
but for me, the one that really stood out the most is when she said, and and I and I wrote this down because it was amazing. I don't have time to not be good to myself. Uh, and she started talking about how it's really not much of a choice because when she's able to be good to herself, it allows her to be good to others. And what was really amazing to me, I mean, self-care is something that we talk about a lot as being really important. Um, but it was in some ways just the way that she talked about it because it was, it was, she was resolute, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it was very much like this, the, this is, I have to, I, you know, I need to take care of myself. I need to meditate. I need to, you know, because when things go down and my job and my career, I mean, things go down and they're serious and I've got to be available. Um, so, so that importance of, of self care, I know I can definitely feel the difference. Like if I've gone more than a, a week or something without yoga, I just feel kind of gross. And then, and then that puts me in a different mindset. And so that's just something to me that, that is really validating and affirming. And I, and I absolutely loved that whole concept. Yeah, I think the self-care piece is really important. And it's about knowing what is self-care for you. Because everyone's going to have it be something different. And it, maybe not everyone's into meditation. Um, maybe it's reading for you. Or maybe it's going for a bike ride or swimming or walking or whatever it is. But I think it's finding that practice and doing it consistently. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's really interesting. I, I thought there was a nice balance and maybe even a tension between this idea of self-care and uh, self-obsession. And specifically, I'm thinking of when she talked about when you're reaching out to people, one of the pieces of advice she would give is make it easy and make it convenient. And really, the whole thrust of that was be thinking about others. And I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think taking care of yourself allows you to think more about others because you are centered and you can come from a place of feeling calm and collected. And so there's not necessarily this frantic, I need to get my needs met or I need to advance my agenda. And I think sometimes when people hear about self care, they can sometimes misinterpret it to mean, Oh, well you're just focused on yourself and your own needs and uh, all the time. But I think it's sort of the opposite. And that's really what she said. You know, she said, I don't have the time to not be good to myself it's because she wants to be her best self for the world and to be productive and service-minded and really make a difference in people's lives, it's important for her to recognize who she needs to be to excel at that. Yeah, and, you know, it makes me think, you know, earlier you said something about, you know, needing to know what type of self-care is best for you. And it makes me think about the introvert-extrovert sort of difference. And uh, I think sometimes we think we think of introverts as being people who are super shy or not able to have conversations or maybe socially awkward. Um, and that could be the case, but, you know, but sometimes people, I mean, you, you will be surprised at, you know, the person in front of the room who's giving some crazy, you know, energetic outgoing presentation is actually in fact a huge introvert. And so, and what, because what that means is that it's more about where you get your, your energy from. And so for introverts being around people and with large groups of people, they like being around people. Um, but, but it, it can be draining for them. And so for an extrovert, you know, that self care could be going out and just being around your friends and gathering them together for a party. But for an introvert, it could be, Oh my gosh, I'm working really, really hard on my passion, on my dream all of the time. And I'm going to all of these networking events and maybe I need to just, take a day or a weekend to go be in the woods or something like mm -hmm. that. That's a great point. I think a lot of the times we always say, what am I supposed to do or who am I supposed to be? And what does, what should it look like if I'm taking care of myself? And one of the things that helps the most, I think is really looking at what is that for you because you want it or because you actually connect with whatever that practice is. And that's something that I've definitely had to deal with a lot in a lot of different areas of my life. I always have a tendency to push things to the deadline uh, in whatever area it is. And for a long time, I thought, oh, if only I could work 
in the same pace as these other people who can start on things a month ahead and pace it out perfectly. Um, and now what I've just realized is the sooner I embraced that I was deadline driven, I could work with it instead of against it. So I could create or have, you know, people like you help me create these internal deadlines that actually get things done, um, when they need to, but rather than sitting there the whole time saying, Oh my gosh, you know, I should be working on this, but I'm not, I should be working on this, but I'm not, I should be working on this, but I'm not. I say, no, what should I be working on right now that needs to happen right now? And have the faith and the confidence to know that when it comes time to work on this, we will work on this and it'll turn out well. But I think that's something that you have to learn over time. And it's not easy because sometimes it's really taking a hard look and saying, okay, this isn't the ideal but how do I work with the reality in front of me? We're saying, to sum that up, self-care actually makes us a lot more effective and compassionate <laughs> human beings. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's a good cap on it. This was a great interview with Janine. Thank you all so much for listening to the Motivational Millennial Podcast. Hope you get to tune in in the future. Please reach out to us at motivationalmillennial.com. We're also on Facebook. Drop us a line, a question. Let us know what's on your mind, and we hope you tune in again soon. Peace. For show notes and upcoming guests, or to learn more about Coactive Coaching, the blog, and our other awesome offerings, visit MotivationalMillennial.com. Keep in touch with us at Facebook.com slash MotivationalMillennial. We'd love to hear from you. Shoot us an email with your thoughts, comments, and suggestions at podcast at MotivationalMillennial.com. And tell us who you might like to hear from, or if you think you or anyone you know would be good for the show. The Motivational Millennial Podcast is edited by Christy Hostler and Team Podcast. Our theme music was composed and performed by Blake Brandis. Have, Have a great, great week, Motivational, motivational Millennials! Janine Cohen After Show. Take two. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.